Today we're going to be looking at a very heavily requested topic, specifically the journey across the Chernobyl exclusion zone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. I'm engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. Uh, one hour of sleep feels terrible. It's like half to nine right now. We got about a half an hour to meet him. Try to do some kind of crazy adventure into Chernobyl with one hour of sleep. <laughs> I don't, so I'm unfamiliar with his channel if that's like part of a challenge that he does for all of these little exploration adventures. Not sure how much of this he plans to do, but it's massive. Over 4,000 square kilometers. Wouldn't recommend trying to do that on limited amount of sleep, but he's the expert on the adventure stuff, not me. I would question that, especially since this would be an exclusion zone, a radiological controlled area. You're going to want to be attentive, look at warning signs, pay attention to a pre-job briefing, be fit for duty, as we say in the industry. Not looking good. Alright, I see they're bringing their food and, and they're bringing water, especially if this trip's going to take a while, because it's not like there's going to be anything to eat in an exclusion zone. In fact, in radiological controlled areas, typically not allowed to eat, even with outside stuff. This is a little different, but this is a long journey. As long as they stay clear of anything that is that is contaminated, it should be fine. But the main reason why you don't eat in a radiological controlled area is to minimize, is so you don't have any internal contamination. Because contamination, when it's inside your body is going to do way more damage to you than it is outside your body. But if you're going on an adventure like that, you're going to need to eat and drink, walking 20 plus kilometers. Especially if it's with outside food, they should be fine. As long as they don't, I don't know, like take the food out of its covering and like and scoop the food for the ground for whatever reason. You shouldn't eat the food if, it, if you do that anyway. In English, yeah. If you get caught in the zone, you got a fine and the stamp passport that we and committed a crime in Yeah, Ukraine. something like that. And you'll have to be ordered to leave the country in a week's notice or some... Seriously, yeah, for one week. Yeah, we will have to leave the country in one week. And when can we... If you want, you can the next day. But they're gonna ask, like, hey, why do you have a stamp? And every time we're gonna have to say, well, we were in Chernobyl. So that's the consequence for being in there, and they're just gonna, okay. That's interesting that they could just, saying they could just let you back in. Wow, it doesn't really seem like much of a consequence. I can't really think of an American analog that I'm familiar with, mainly because radiological controlled areas are so restricted. In a nuclear power plant, you have to get your security clearance before they even let you to the yard where the yard contains the buildings that are adjacent to the building where the radiological controlled area is located. So it's so heavily secured. Now granted, that's a small area. And the reason why I said I can't think of an analog is there isn't, like there isn't really anything like that because you already have to go through so much security to enter. But in a situation like this, where there's such a large part of the environment that it would be impractical to basically have a checkpoint at every possible way you can enter this Chernobyl exclusion zone, it's just different. Radiological controlled areas in a nuclear power plant, well, to get there, you need to get on the other side of a security fence where if you don't have access, nuclear power plants have an armed security force where use of deadly force is authorized against intruders. And there are signs posted in conspicuous locations within power plants. So an exclusion zone being a radiological controlled area, this is a very, this is very different. Uh, he's been to the zone four times and three out of those four times he got caught. The first time it was an accident. The second time they were so tired walking back that they actually went on the main road where police drive to get caught to be driven out of the zone. Wow, that's, that's insane. Our boy went to get the visimeter from his contact. He wants to go alone because contact is renting. He's really suspicious that we're going to Chernobyl and he does not want to rent us the dosimeter that way. So he's like wrong as a student. Now dosimeters, you can buy them freely within the United States. Maybe it's different in Ukraine. I don't know, but 
They need to be... They're not... I mean, like anything else, there's a wide range in price, but you can get them for less than a hundred bucks. And there are some that are several hundred to over a thousand bucks. So, I mean, it, it kind of depends. But for the purpose of what they're doing, they could, they could get a cheap one. But maybe it's... Maybe they're harder to get in Ukraine for some reason. I, I don't actually know. Right, so much got. And now we have a uh, nine. Oh yeah, just like that. Perfect, simple, inexpensive, easy to use. Ten. Ten. <laughs> Maybe this. All right, so the units are in microsieverts per hour. So 0 0.09 microsieverts per hour. Yeah, that's background radiation. That's actually below average. Now, background radiation can vary widely, and a lot of that, how close you are to uranium or thorium ore is probably one of your biggest thing. That's that's why radon test kits exist in houses, but that's background, actually kind of at the low end of background radiation. The average dose rate worldwide is 2.4 millisieverts per year. Now that's millisieverts or 2,400 microsieverts per year. That figures out to about 0.27 per hour. Or is it to the perimeter? Uh, 15 kilometers. It is 50. We're fucking close. Yes, 15 oh, kilometers. It's 10. So they're a lot closer to Chernobyl, 50 kilometers out, 0.1 microsievert per hour, so not much of a difference. So they're driving closer in and now it went up to 0.12. We're still within rounding errors of background radiation and that those dosimeters aren't exactly the most precise, especially at low doses. Radiation follows the inverse square law. You half your distance to the source, dose goes up by a factor of four. So we're two kilometers away from the exclusion zone? It's 10, I think. We're back down to 0.1 microsieverts per hour. It's very low dose, even at two kilometers. So what we saw in the car was clearly nothing to do with Chernobyl. Nine. So. The first radiological posting. Now, this isn't really much of a posting, but I could tell, like, post-accident, I'm sure they just said, hey, here be radiation kind of signs. Here's what I'm used to seeing. Caution radiation area. What this means is a dose rate of 50 microsieverts per hour, 30 centimeters away from the source or higher. High radiation areas were up to 1 millisievert or 1,000 microsieverts per hour, 30 centimeters from the source. Note that at 100 millisieverts is where the threshold for an increased risk of cancer is. And the dose limit for radiological workers is half that at 50 millisievert. And then there's this one. Grave danger is right. Because here you're looking at 500 rads or 5 sieverts, not microsieverts, not millisieverts, sieverts, 1 meter from the source, not 30 centimeters. If you absorb 5 sieverts, fairly high chance of death even with treatment. And 10 sieverts, or if you stay at one of these zones for, for 2 hours, or possibly shorter, because that's what the minimum requirement is, then death will be certain. It'll just be a question of how long it's going to take. I've never seen anything marked with a grave danger sign. And there's a reason why it's shaped like a stop sign, is in you really don't want to go there. I've actually only been to a high radiation area once. Several regular radiation areas, but no grave danger postings. So we are officially in the zone right now. The dosimeter says it's 0 0.10, Kiev at max had 0 0.13 or something, at the limit it's is 30 or 50 something. Yeah, yes. so we use it this on the ground. Yes. Eth I've never heard the term ethical limit. Maybe something's a bit lost in translation there. Now normally you wear a dosimeter um, somewhere on your upper body, like on your shirt. I've seen it pinned around, around your collar. I've seen them in, in a shirt pocket, that sort of thing. Putting it directly towards something that's mainly for trying to assess counts like with a guy i've seen like with a uh, geiger counter but here you're measuring how much dose you are receiving not necessarily what the source is emitting but i see what they're trying to do they're trying to see if it goes up if you put it near the ground 
it's, it's still the same. You say if we find metal, metal should have more radiation technically. Yes, of course. Metal, more radiation technically. Um, it depends. Part of this would be a lot of the dirt was excavated as part of the liquidation process, the, the accident cleanup process for Chernobyl, but you can't really do that readily with metal, so that might be what they're going after if he's observed higher doses in metal. But metal isn't by itself necessarily more radioactive or more contaminated than dirt just by virtue of it being metal. Definitely taking our pants off. Wanna swim? Yes. Yes. Don't think there's any actual regulation on swimming in a radiological controlled area. It's not something that really comes up. Though, there's not really a radiological hazard, at least with this particular river, or even necessarily in a spent fuel pool at a nuclear power plant, until you, unless you get right next to the fuel assemblies and bear hug them or something. But again, the biggest hazard associated with swimming in a spent fuel pool would just be the hazards of swimming in any body of water. I mean, it's pretty warm. It's like a hot tub. It's probably going to be about a, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface. It's more of you don't want people in there possibly dropping stuff that can fall down in the fuel assemblies and then you have like a foreign material event and basically the, the fuel assembly is getting stuff on them that can interfere in their transport to and from either the reactor vessel or the dry cast storage if the spent fuel is completely done. It's more of a cleanliness thing than anything else. Radioactive man. It's, it's gonna give us super <laughs> That's funny, but... Now, nah. one thing about, about water is it's actually very good at protecting you from radiation. That's why spent fuel is in a pool, it's in water. Water is very good at absorbing the dose and just the heat, the residual heat that comes from the spent fuel. As far as the whole post-Chernobyl stuff, this river that's, again, they said their dose rate was 0.3 microsieverts per hour. It's possible to have a higher dose rate, say, in the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon or something, just because you're near a lot of rock formations or something like that, than you would get in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, which is interesting. I don't know what the dose rate is there, and it's not really monitored in, in the Grand Canyon, but I wouldn't be surprised if you got a higher dose rate there. Six mashed potatoes and some uh, meat parts. That's some... Uh rice i mean there it sounds like they brought the right stuff just like you would on any long hiking adventure and everything is kept sealed in bags of this stuff if you had to eat in a radiological controlled area these aren't bad choices 0 0.07 right now as minimum as it can get the ground 0 11 all good so far <laughs> dose rates even less i love it <laughs> crazy because this area has been so far abandoned that they just go in and find all these houses and stuff. Not a whole lot there though. These are all new ones. Now that's just spooky. Uh, I guess predatory animals, but they are very defensive. Talking about predatory, all this road, like five kilometers or whatever, wolves have been howling on the left side. 22 Never something I would expect to cover in a radiological briefing. Wild animals, wolves, predators, that sort of thing. It's crazy when a radiological controlled area, and granted, I'm using that term just to describe something as it would pertain if it was in the u.s i know things are a little different given the size and scope of the chernobyl exclusion zone but when it's merged with the wildlife it's just crazy and it's like that's those are going to be your biggest dangers right here being out in the dark in a remote area with animals even just being in the dark without anyone to come to come help you those are your big hazards Forget the radiation, all they're finding is background or less than background in other parts of the world. We are going to sleep in this area. Those are not ant hills, those are just small hills. There are a bunch of moose bucks, whatever, all around. There's just fucking screaming. I don't know what that's all about, but... Man, and then falling, falling asleep out here. Again, never heard of anyone sleeping like for the night in a radiological controlled area. I've heard of certain people sleeping on the job, but that's a different story. And not in the radiological controlled area. Those are... Those are in a different hidden spot that isn't monitored. Guten Morgen. 
I'm gonna wake up and sleep in bag in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. This is, this is kind of funny. Actually, what we didn't do yesterday was check how much radiation is here. Now that's one thing they probably should have done, it's just to be mindful of, of your dose rates if you're going to be in a spot for an extended period of time. I mean, yeah, their dose rate is clearly back, just background, but just as part of a fundamental if you have a radiation dose monitor. In the nuclear plant, we mark these spots with these low dose waiting area signs. So if you're in, say, the reactor containment building during a refueling outage or something where dose rate is... Not a lot, but higher than it is normally, based on whatever plant conditions may be. There are zones that if you're just going to be sitting there for a while, the doses, the doses are low. And this would be the spot, if you happen to do an overnight or in a radiological controlled area, this would be the spot to sleep. There should be like a road that we're going to take. These power lines are powering some of the stuff. I'm not sure of the percentage. We're going on at the Chernobyl reactor. Technically, if we would follow them all the way through, we would reach the main reactor where everything happened. We've been walking for about right now. Near now, we say the main reactor. Uh, so Chernobyl Unit 4 is the one that had the meltdown and explosion. Is Chernobyl the power plant continue to operate after the accident. Not Unit 4. Unit 4 was completely destroyed. The accident happened in 1986, but the rest of the plant didn't shut down. The rest of the plant continued to generate power throughout the 80s, and the last re reactor, Unit 3, was shut down for the last time in 2000. A lot of people don't realize that the power station continued to operate long after the accident. There are horse police in fucking Chernobyl. So they go through this road and then in the village. Yes, 21. Oh. That's something I wasn't aware of. Uh, mounted police in, in Chernobyl. Interesting. Oh my gosh, it's increasing as we go forward. Fuck yeah. 22. <laughs> <laughs> How far is the village from here? They're up to 22 microsieverts. It'll go up as you get closer. We didn't want hard driving by him. Probably you can hear from the sound that something is not right. So he just laid there, turned his dosimeter on, and just put it next to him. Shit started going off crazy. Okay, so they're closer now. Um, a lot of times you'll have dosimeters will have an alarm, and that is set by the health physics technicians during the radiological briefing. Now, the alarm is mainly to alert people that, hey, like you're used to a dose rate of, say, 30 microsieverts per hour. If you hop into a, an area where you're at 50, it's going to go off. Uh, there, there's sometimes a few different types of alarms depending on the dosimeter. One is the instantaneous number. You wanted to set it at 50, or you'll have a sustained dose rate alarm say at 40 like if it stays at 40 for more than say 30 seconds you'll get an alarm but it'll it'll tell you on the dosimeter what type of alarm you've got because you put a limit on 30. yep okay so he put a limit on 30 and th which is good that was a good idea to put a limit on 30 because 30 is about what the is a little above what background radiation is typically right, screaming on 54. So far, this is not going to be a problem unless we fucking live here. That is reactor number five right there. Now, Chernobyl units five and six were never actually completed, again, because of the Chernobyl accident. Chernobyl was going to be a big six-unit power station. When the explosion happened, all the debris from the reactor blew by the wind into that part, and the trees actually turned red from all the poisonous contamination. And when you look at post-accident stuff, that's mainly... What can be just as much of a factor is which direction the wind is blowing in terms of what gets hit and what doesn't. That's why evacuation and shelter-in-place orders are determined based on wind direction more so than anything else. And radiological survey teams look at that when you make uh, recommendations to, again, which areas should evacuate, shelter-in-place, where we need additional survey maps done, that sort of thing. That is 1,000. So th is, this the red is it a thousand or is it ten? Near it. It's like right next to the fucking red forest. Okay. All of this shit, not to mention the radiation. I mean, it makes sense. It's probably t it's probably ten microsieverts per hour, but it makes sense for the dose rate to be higher because again, that's where the contamination was. And while it's been cleaned up and a lot of it has decayed away since, you're going to see elevated rates relative to the immediate surrounding area. 
Now, none of it anywhere close to being to being a problem. After all, we're still below uh, radiation area threshold. As much as we would like to rest here, the radiation levels have actually doubled. Right now, it is 2,000. Again, they're multiplying everything by 100 <laughs> based on how they, they're reading that dosimeter. But yeah, when dose rates are elevated relative to just an area shortwise away, you're going to want to rest in the area with the lower dose rate. Simple, basic, ALARA, or as low as reasonably achievable principle when it comes to radiation protect. Again, these guys are fine, but it's kind of, I can tell it's kind of unnerving that they set their dosimeter alarm so low, which is, I mean, it's better that than the other way around, but you can tell how it's kind of unnerving these guys, even though they're nowhere close to getting dangerous amounts of radiation. 20.4. Not bad. Okay, we definitely evaded the major radiation. Yeah. The biggest hazard is probably you're more likely to hurt yourself trudging through this terrain that isn't really marked or doesn't have a trail or possibly getting bit by some insect. A normal insect, not some super mutated super bug that's going to turn you into Spider-Man or something like that. Yeah, it is still a good practice for them to rest in areas with a lower dose rate. They might wear their dosimeter battery out just by having that alarm go off constantly, though. They need to be able to set the alarm, because then, because right now it's not really alert and it's more of just, just a nuisance. Not that bad. There you go, they're resting in a relatively low dose uh, waiting area. This is reminding me of that TV show that used to be on the History Channel, Life After People, where you just see these abandoned areas, and it was like a hypothetical, what if everyone actually left? But here in Pripyat, you can actually see, in Pripyat, you can actually see what, what happened and what state of disrepair these buildings are in after a few decades. It's... These are amazing shots, just this crazy view that you get to see in Pripyat and not many people have done this it's that's it yeah you can see the sarcophagus or really the new safe confinement structure they slid over the sarcophagus the sarcophagus was a hastily built structure that had all kinds of problems with it inside this building complex that's what's crazy. People that are still there. I don't know if they live there, if they're just other explorers like this, but man, that's unnerving. This is like the setting for one of those survival horror video games or something. Dude, right on the edge. Wow, this guy. I mean, there, there's, again, there's your bigger hazard than the radiation being falling off these buildings that are in disrepair. This is nothing lower than Kyo. Interesting how you find there is there's a lot of low dose spots in and again a lot of it depends which direction is the wind blowing because so that forest which is further out it's possible to have lower dose areas that are further away from the source and that's because well that are further away from the reactor because note that I said it's from the source not the reactor the source being the contamination from the reactor that happened to eject in a certain direction. That red forest was a lot close, was further away from the reactor, but it happened to be an area of accumulated dose, which is why that dose rate is still higher there than it is in this abandoned gym in Pripyat. <laughs> the iconic Chernobyl Ferris wheel. Or Pripyat Ferris wheel. I like that he used the outside... <laughs> where you're supposed to kind of slide in and climb the ladder versus he just climbed it on the outside. But hey, at least he used gloves rather than putting his hands on that rust. Just, uh, just a bit of a safety moment there. <laughs> I mean, it was a theme park. I know from what I've heard in, and this is strictly going on class off of classes I took, and various lectures I did, on, lectures I went to on the subject of Chernobyl, both when I was in college and when I was getting my senior reactor operator license. So I can't say this with, so that's where I heard this from, not from a firsthand account. But Pripyat was going to be this really cool city that had amenities 
theme parks. Even people that worked at the plant would have nice cars by 1980s Soviet standards anyway. This was supposed to be the the pride of the Soviet Union here as far as not only the, the power plant, but, but the town. It ended so tragically and for everyone involved, but this place was going to be a relatively nice place to live given that it was part of the Soviet Union. It's interesting seeing this in part of the, the remains of the town. So this is the office building managing the uh, Chernobyl power plant. That is cool. Interesting, and they have just a radiation symbol like it's a, like it's a logo of some sorts, because obviously the office building wouldn't be a radiological controlled area, but it's, it's interesting to, uh, to see something like that. Yeah, it's not a whole lot different. You have your office buildings managing the plant wouldn't necessarily be part of the plant or even the protected area by the plant. It just depends on how these buildings are laid out. Again, where I worked, the office building was outside of the fence, so to speak. So outside of the protected area. So you don't have the same strict security requirements in the office building than you do inside the fence where the plant is. And then when you get to areas like the control room, the areas where safe shutdown equipment is, that's an additional layer of security on top of it. But here, for the office building, it would just be level one. 1997. Some of the reactors were still operating in 1997. Unit three was still operating in 1997. Three to the uh, safety limit. Interesting. Now again, when he says safety limit, that's an arb that's an arbitrary number they pick just to set what their dose rates at. One point two six microsieverts per hour. Yeah, that's above back. Yeah, that's above background, but it's not going to result in any adverse effects. You'd have to be there for for just under a hundred thousand hours before you have an increased risk of cancer. It's interesting that it goes up a little bit as they get closer to the source of water, and that's. Probably just because water by its nature, when you're this close, is a very high energy sort of environment in terms of moving various sediment, particulate matter. So some of that could be contaminants from the Chernobyl accident. But again, we're talking very small concentrations, even relative to the Red Forest. One of the main reasons the reactor was built, because it has a nice big water source to function with. That is true. You can use a body of water to cool the reactor, to act as a coolant source. Now, it's, actually, it's mainly for the main condenser in the secondary part of the power plant, the non-nuclear part. The power plant that I worked at had a cooling reservoir of 7,000 acres, which is a little over 28 square kilometers. As the Chernobyl exclusion zone includes portion of Belarus. That's right. They were both part of the Soviet Union at the time, but it's interesting now that it's split between two sovereign nations. The accident was so severe that it's affecting multiple countries now. And it was a, an international coalition that actually built the new safe confinement structure that they slid over the hastily built sarcophagus to keep the Chernobyl building. Choice, actually. Yeah, the water does look sketchy, but tested, I drank myself. That's weird. So forget the whole radiological controlled area part and the radiation has just this been sitting out here for decades unattended. I mean, hey, they, they tested it. They got antibacterial tablets to go along with them, but and I wouldn't want to bring it. And I guess they just couldn't carry enough water because if they're going to be trekking through for days and with no areas to resupply out here, because what they're doing this overt journey through here. Yeah, that's a lot. Now they're in an abandoned classroom with all the books and stuff just strewn everywhere after they all left in a hurry and plus been sitting in disrepair for this long. Just Soviet flags sitting there out of nowhere. Specifically, but I'm done said it made resonator tools. It is definitely something related to the power plant. Interesting. And like this whole area in this exclusion zone, like the economy was centered there. That's why Pripyat existed was to have one of the reasons why Pripyat even existed was to have that power plant because again it was going to be a six unit site big producing a lot of what they thought clean what they thought was safe nuclear power it turns out that particular way of making nuclear power had many design and operational flaws that contributed to the accident but the point is that entire local economy was around that power plant so 
dosimeter factory, um, spare parts, even like warehouses, spare parts for all the tool making all the tools that they need to keep that power plant running. Yeah, not surprised they're just going to put a plop a factory up right next to the power plant. And the power plant probably even provides power for the factory. Now they're on the Duga site. This was a crazy radar system for meant for missile defense as an early warning system that the Soviets made back in the 1970s. Damn. So this is the exclusion zone. You can see the whole exclusion zone. So more about this Duga system, it was in over-the-horizon radar, which meant that it bounced radio waves off of the ionosphere so it can detect things beyond visual range. And remember, this was back in the time before, like, GPS and, like, satellite communication was that sophisticated, so this was kind of an interesting transitional technology. It used high-frequency symbols, so there's a bit of a joke referring to Duga as the Russian woodpecker, because it made little tappy-tappy noises, kind of like that. And while it provided this extended range for missile detection caused a lot of interference including with civilian radio operators and you could hear it all over the world just that that whole tapping interference and it didn't last very long it was decommissioned back in the 1980s um due to concerns of that interference and also satellite technology was was getting better so the need for this sort of detection system didn't didn't really exist anymore but it's this fascinating crazy structure thing all the way from there. well yeah you can see pretty much the entire journey right here it's amazing it's crazy these guys did something like that and again out in the essentially a reclaimed wilderness That's the other thing, climbing all these things, no safety equipment whatsoever. I mean, I guess he's wearing gloves to protect him from the rust, but man. <laughs> Radiation is probably the least dangerous thing these guys did on their trip. Just gonna say that right now. I'm getting a bit of vertigo just watching this. Fucking incredible. A lot of engineering went into this. It's crazy. Yeah, I'm I'm the closest. Oh, wow. Gotta make a run for it. This is like just one of those movies where you see that after they saw what they needed or wanted to see, then the security comes after them. Shoes. So they're getting ready to leave. You'd walk through something that looks kind of like this and you would step in, face those detectors, those things that look kind of like cheese graters, and it would scan you, and then you'd turn around and face the, uh, the other way. And that what that does is it just checks to see if you have anything contaminated or, on you. Even if you didn't go into a marked contaminated area, you'd still get checked, just to be sure. But I guess the closest thing these guys have is to take their dosimeter and see if it goes up near, near their shoes or their backpacks or their clothes and that sort of thing. But it is good that they're at least checking that. That's a, that's a good practice to have. Civilization, gonna go to the store, gonna get some food, done. <laughs> Take a well-deserved break after that crazy trip. Man, thank you so much for recommending this. This was really cool to watch something like this. And it's interesting that they actually did some good radiological practices, like not staying in the higher dose areas than you'd need to, or and checking their articles of clothing before they left. Based on those dose rates they got there, they were never in any real danger, at least radiologically. As far as the um, wildlife hazards or the being at heights without safety equipment hazards, that's a whole nother animal. But as far as radiological safety, these guys were never really in any real danger. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.